Thank you everybody for joining us today in person, on the line, and for those of you watching us on video. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jeff Holzman. I'm the company's uh, chief operating officer. I've been with Reef for a couple of years now. I started uh, my career at Reef with IRM, our uh, subsidiary division down on the second floor. Worked my way up to asset management and eventually to this role as chief operating officer of the entire group. I'll be talking about operations today, and we're gonna focus on two things. One, which you may have seen, which is our fantastic uh, company manual. This is our hard copy. We'll be using the digital version. This is something that uh, Ali Irving and I have worked on for a very long time. Ali did most of the work here in writing this. This is really just for show, uh, because it's paper, and it's already very much outdated. The real version that we use is right here online. We're already at version 7, so 1.07. We update it every week. Every week we get something new. And I'm going to tell you all about this book and how and why we use it. The other thing I'll talk about is our analytics, uh, our Power BI system. Microsoft Power BI, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a business intelligence engine, which we use. Uh, everything that you're seeing, we've built in-house. And I'm going to take you some of, through some of these slides and these dashboards. I'll show you the interactivity, and I'll explain how all that works. I plan to talk for about 40, 45 minutes or so. That will leave us about 10, 15 minutes for questions. So it's not a monologue. If you have a question and you want to interrupt, you can. Otherwise, consider that I will live some time. I will leave some time for questions at the end. All right, so without further ado, let's begin. The first thing you want to understand about uh, Reef is Reef has been around for a long time and we're not perfect, but we have incorporated operational logic from multiple other disciplines, including medicine, including aviation, including real estate, which we're in, financial investments, and a lot of tech. All that really kind of boils down to what you're seeing here. This is our company manual. It's not like the HR manual that everybody gets when they start working here that just tells you, you know, the basic HR stuff. This is a real company manual that goes in depth every single department, every single role within every department, and gives you three things. And these are the three things to remember. We give you a brief description of your role within the department so you have an understanding of what's expected of you. We give you best practices, procedures, and checklists, which will really help you kind of do your job in every single department. It doesn't matter if you're in capital partners, underwriting, analytics, asset management, property management. We give you all of those best tools. And we give you a summary of what we call, and this is huge for us, it's what we call the debrief. The debrief is every time we do a major transaction, we all get together and we debrief it. We talk to each other and we say, what went well? What didn't go well? Why? Why did things go well? Why did the things that go wrong went wrong? What can we do better next time? And all of that insight, all of that knowledge, all of those best practices, including the list of things that went wrong in the past, we also give you in the manual. So reading that manual and with a focus on your role in your department will really help you, and this is where it gets, uh, um, and you'll hear me say this a lot, institutional knowledge. One of the uh, benefits of working for a large institution, one that has been around for a long time, is that you have the benefit of learning from other people's mistakes, best practices, and things that they've encountered over the, over the years. So for those of you that have not been here a long time and don't have those lessons kind of baked into your day to day, a lot of it, not all of it, but a lot of it can be found through this manual. So I'm gonna kind of slightly take you through this. We're not gonna, we're not gonna focus on everything. It's over 250 pages long. Uh, but I'll show you some of the key things. So again, this is a live document. It lives online. And some of the things that you can find here, first off, you can see that it's all uh, indexed, every department, procedures, and it's all uh, hyperlinked. So you really can jump right into what it is that you're looking for. And I'm just going to kind of flip through and talk you through uh, some of the things that are here. So we start with general abbreviations, and not all abbreviations are the same in every industry. So people that have come to us from oil and gas, from hospitality, from financial services, we had people that come here from software engineering, we had people that came fresh out of college. This is a way to help you kind of align the terminology that we use so you use it the right way. And again, without this, it could be very confusing. We've had people working here for over a year not understanding that a certain abbreviation they're using is not what the legal term uh, the legal department is using. It's not what the asset managers are using. So this really helps you kind of sink in uh, with the group. Uh, we have a lot of information here uh, um, about the company itself. We have 
uh, a table that basically outlines what every single one of the departments do. And we find that we have people that work here for six months and you don't even know the initials of every department. Do you guys know how many people work for Reef today, the group? Take a stab at it. 80? Close. It's 315. Uh, so there's about 80 people that work in this building alone, between the third and second floor. If you take into account all the property managers that we have on the different properties, people that do maintenance, rent collection, cleaning, uh, engineering, all of those people work for us. They're on our payroll. You haven't met a lot of those people, but they all work for Reef. Uh, so when you talk about this many people, I don't know everybody. I don't reckon a lot of them would know me, would know my face on from the website, from the CEO videos that we're doing. They would probably recognize Kip. They would recognize uh, Craigle. I don't know every single one of them. I literally sometimes meet people and they'll say, oh yeah, I work for Reef. I'm like, oh, wow, great. I didn't know. When you get to that level, you need organizational structure because it can no longer be, I met you, we spoke over lunch, I told you how things are. I'm not going to meet you. You could spend a decade working here, we wouldn't even know each other. So you must have this institutional knowledge. So we explain what every single department does. We give everybody kind of best practices. This is our onboarding checklist. So this is something when you're a new employee at Reef, it tells you what to expect before you start, your first day, within your first week. We, we reference you in the right direction. One of the key things that a manual like this provides and a structure like this provides is certainty of outcome, uniformity. I know that your experience is going to be the same as your experience. It's going to be the same as your experience because you're following a certain trajectory. That doesn't guarantee that it's the right experience. It, we could still mess something up and consistently mess it up. The beauty of that is the debrief. That's why when you think about our company manual, you have to think about the debrief concept together. It's kind of a closed loop. As long as everybody works according to this procedure, and this is always the best example, onboarding, right? Like this is your first day on the job, what do you do? It tells you, uh, you need to sign your uh, HR uh, letter. You need to go to Mitsa to get a computer, to get a desk, to get a fob. Uh, we, we tell you everything from where to park your car to how to set up your email password. But we consistently do that. Everybody has the same experience on the first day. That allows me, through the debrief as the company COO, to sit with guys like you and say, all right, how was your onboarding process? Tell me. How was your first month on the job? Did you know what our office hours were? Did you have a computer? Did you have email access? Did everything work out? Did you know what is expected of you? Did you know who your supervisor is? And if I hear something consistently, that a constant feedback, then I tweak the manual and I, I, I make it better. And that way for the next batch of people, they learn from that institutional knowledge. So when you hear that a lot about institutional investors, this is how we become one, right? We, we preserve all that knowledge, certainty of outcome. We make sure that everybody's experience is the same and we make it better. And again, that's just an example for, uh, for onboarding. There's tons of other examples. This is a really interesting one. This is the uh, management meeting intervals. We're basically telling you how we are managing this company. We have essentially uh, broken it down into four different segments. On a weekly basis, we have our IC. I think most of you got a chance to participate, observe, or at least listen to IC. It's done every Tuesdays here. IC stands for Investment Committee. Essentially what we do is that is our weekly check-in. It is the most basic fundamental unit of management that we have here. We get together every week. There's always exceptions, but generally speaking, it's every week. And we review the different department. We review the different pipelines and status. We hand out tasks and then we break off and every director takes responsibility for their department for the next week. Next Tuesday, we come back, we check in, we keep doing it that way on a weekly interval. We know what everybody's doing. On a monthly level, we have an executive committee, which is fewer people. We talk higher level. And on a quarterly basis, four times a year, on a quarterly basis, we have a director's summit, which allows us to essentially get all the directors. We usually do it here. And we kind of interact between departments. And there's, it, it could get contentious, right? We have departments saying, hey, you guys need to give us the underwriting quicker. And legal is not turning around the term sheets quick enough. We hash that out because we can't waste our time doing that every week. So again, by, by looking at this, by reading this, by adhering to these procedures, you're becoming kind of embedded in the institution. You understand how we work, 
why we do what we do, who does what, what is expected of you. All right, I think you're getting the sense of it, so I'll, I'll kind of fast forward. Um, everything from uh, how to use your phone. Why do you think we put this in the manual? Because people like me can't operate one without. Because we don't want to spend our days uh, answering questions. He's exactly right. If you're a new employee or a seasoned employee, you might find things here that you didn't even know about. So instead of going to the office manager or the admin staff and saying, my phone doesn't work and you fix that, we put all that in the manual. We give you a copy of the manual and we say, hey, read this, get yourself set, situated and go, go do what you need to do. And we're still in the admin chapter. We haven't even started talking about the actual business. But you're getting a sense of how we organize the company, how the company operates. And that's, that's my responsibility in the operations department. Um, all right, we'll fast forward. This is uh, uh, a travel. We have our own dedicated app. I don't know if you knew that, but you can download an app to your phone. Um, the company's credit card is already on file. We have certain policies, uh, so you can't book yourself on first class to Paris. That, we're not going to allow that. The app will not let you do it. But if you need to travel to one of our properties, the app will find you a flight. We'll book the flight. It's like a 24-7 a travel desk that's at your disposal. So again, streamlining operations. Instead of you paying and filing expenses, we keep things simple. Um, and it works, works really, really well. Um, all right, let me jump into some, uh, some of the other stuff that's not admin. This is, always, uh, this is always an interesting one. This is the fleet, the list of uh, the fleet of airplanes that are at our disposal here at Reef and, uh, and where they are, how far they go, how to book them. So you're seeing there's, there's a lot of good stuff here. Uh, believe it or not, how to use the copier, it's not, it's not for copying, it's for scanning. I worked here for six months until I realized I was doing it wrong. Uh, there's a certain way of doing it, and if you read the instructions, it, it automatically scans and it will tell you where to find it on the Z drive. So all of that stuff incorporated in the manual so we don't have to answer questions. Uh, we have stuff here about cybersecurity, about IT, uh, but this is where it gets interesting. So, this, by the way, this is alphabetical. That's why we start with accounting. Nobody's more important than the other. We simply uh, go alphabetically to ABC. What I want you to observe, and you don't have to, we're not gonna do a deep dive into accounting, but what I want you to uh, observe is the structure. Subsection, so, so chapter number five is accounting. Uh, obviously, other departments, other numericals. Subsection one is always gonna be what I told you, right? It's always gonna be the description. So at a minimum, you'll get a description of what this department does, and we usually refer in the description to their main goal. So they get a sense of what it is they're supposed to achieve. Subsection two is always an org chart. Ali will maintain the org chart. She, updated, she updates the uh, org chart every week, and all of this gets sucked into a master org chart that we occasionally provide investors. We were just talking about the big meeting that was here yesterday. That was one of the things one of the main things that they ask for. When we go to print that, we actually print it on a, an 11 by 17, so it's like a big stretched paper, and we fit the entire company org chart uh, in that. It's, uh, it's, the company org chart includes headquarters and key people at uh, property management. We do not go down to the 315 people level. Uh, it's usually not required. Um, and then we go, subsection three is the approved procedures. That's what I talked about, best practices, checklists, references. So different departments will have different approved procedures, but they're all numbered and some, some have five, some have 24, depending on the complexity of the department. But this is the heart of the matter. So if you're not in the accounting department, you would probably never need to reference or follow or even fully understand every one of these approved procedures but they are there for you to see. And that's part of our transparency concept. We want every team member in the organization to be able to open the approved procedures for another department and understand what they do and how they do it. Do you guys, does it make sense to you why that's a good idea, right? So a lot of times you're talking to somebody and they would ask for a certain data point. You'd be like, why do you need that, man? Like, uh, leave me alone, I got other stuff to do. And once you understand how they operate, and you'll see the dashboards in a minute, you'll understand why every department is asking for a certain data point because that is their role. There are systems of checks and balances and updates that feed our dashboard system. That's how we run the company. And it also helps us find issues. If you feel like someone is asking something of you and you don't understand why it's required, 
You can always escalate something like that to me and I'll find out, hey, maybe it's not required. Maybe we're just wasting time. There absolutely is a concept of, uh, we call it spillage, of people working on stuff that nobody needs or you're doing something that he's already doing by maintaining an order in, in defining the processes that every individual is supposed to accomplish, we can have control on whether or not you're doing something that needs to be done, you're doing it fast enough, not fast enough. It allows us to, to tangibly talk about performance. Uh, so we'll go through accounting. You can see that they do everything from distributions to maintaining bank accounts to providing K-1s uh, tax at the end of the day. And then we have this, uh, what we call the periodical table. This is, in this case, it's a subsection five. The periodical table, it's not your periodical table from chemistry, obviously, we just use that uh, as kind of a name. It really tells you what, the part, what this department is doing. We're still talking about accounting on a daily, weekly, monthly, annually, and as needed basis. Really, when you think about it, if you use this table, th these are all hyperlinks, right? So you can click on it. It, it. You can literally open it up every Monday. This is something you're supposed to do every week. Click on it, follow the steps. Oh, I need to do this, 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 and that. So we really, we try to make your job easier. Now, here's an important bit of information. I always use this analogy. This is not a recipe for chocolate cake. You can't put all the ingredients in the oven and consistently get a chocolate cake uh, the same way you want it every time. That's not what this is. We've had people say, oh, can I take a picture of this or can I get a copy of this? Sure you can. Because you know what? Without the knowledge that goes into being an accountant, you're not gonna get the outcome that you're expecting to get. Um, a lot of knowledge still has, and, and skill set and experience still goes into doing this. This is a reference, it's a framework that helps you make sure that you follow the right steps. Why am I telling you all that? Because this table and everything that it links to is not gonna make you an amazing employee at Reef. It's going to be the baseline. You probably won't lose your job as long as you do all of this correctly at the right interval. But that is the basis of what we expect. Obviously, people here, cer certainly the, the more senior staff, knows how to do this well and has input on how to do it better and can handle situations that the table really doesn't address. And that happens too. So I'm not saying that you can all be robots, follow what the book says, and it, it's going to work always. That's not what it is. But it is a framework that allows us consistency. So we know that if I put you in the accounting department, I train you, I give you the manual. Generally speaking, I expect you to do what it says. I know I'm going to get a good outcome. Does that make sense? Make sense to everybody? Good. All right. Uh, we'll look at a few more and we'll jump to Power BI. Um, acquisitions department, you can see the consistency. Subsection one is the description, some goals. Uh, subsection two is your org chart. Subsection three is your, all of your different approved procedures. And you can see that sometimes we uh, will refer you to another chapter. So the underwriting department and the acquisitions department are actually very closely intertwined. I'm sure you've seen that they literally sit in the same area and they work very, very closely together. And we've kind of, uh, they do what we call low resolution underwriting. So acquisitions will basically, will do basic underwriting just to see if it's, if it's interesting or not. Should we continue or not? It's a filter, it's a screen. If it is interesting, they'll escalate it to the full blown underwriting department and we'll get a full detailed model. But that takes time and money. So we don't do that on every single deal that somebody offers us. Um, Think of it as kind of back on the envelope, right? So I'm like, eh, let me see if this makes sense. Yeah, close enough. So we do say for more information regarding underwriting, reference 2231 and 2232. And that's hyperlinked. It will take you right back to underwriting and give you more information. So you can see that even if you're sitting at home reviewing the manual, you learn about who's who and what they do and how it all kind of connects together. Um, there's tons of stuff here, which you'll see like this where they're, they're supporting documents for the manual. So let's say, for example, we use this a lot uh, across all different departments. We'll say, hey, whenever you're putting a file on our computer system, on our Z drive, make sure you follow the Z drive guidelines. And if you click on it, a document will open up. It's external to the manual. And it's essentially a guide that tells you these are the standard reef structured folders and what goes into every folder. It, you may not think about this, but for a company our size and growing fast, one of the biggest problems is finding files. Without a specific system of how to do this and how to file things, everybody just put 
a file wherever they make sense to them. Some people name it by date, some people give it an initial, some people just call it what, based on an email that they got it in. And you know what, when you leave or if you're on vacation or you now have 25 assets to manage, you don't remember, it's almost impossible to find that file again. So we don't work that way. Again, institutional knowledge. Everything is done the same consistently over time. Rinse and repeat. By doing that, I can take you off of an asset and give it to him and I can put you in charge of an asset that he once had and it will be pretty much transparent because you'll open the folders and the purchase and sale agreement is going to be in the same place. The financial uh, reports will be in the same folder. Rent rolls will be where you expect them to be. Investor updates will be where they're supposed to be. Make sense? So that kind of uniform, and you're not going to know that until we give you guidance. So we give it to you, we give it to you in writing. Um, all right, what else we got? Um, I'm not going to go through, you can see kind of how that repeats, subsection five, the periodical table. This goes into the admin. We have uh, the asset management department, which is a really big one. Uh, analytics department, we explain all the different systems that they use. Uh, and again, I really want you to understand, and this is a good example here in the asset management department, their subsection three uh, has, I think it's like 25 different procedures, some of them extremely complicated. So the way we did this, we talked to the asset managers, we looked at asset managers in other companies across the industry, and we broke it down to the basic building blocks. What does an asset manager do? They pay taxes, they make sure we have insurance, they write quarterly updates, they work on a budget, they meet with property management, uh, they, they'll do capex allocations. We broke that down, we gave them best practices, checklists, references for every single one of those and put it in a book. Now those guys and girls are super busy. You know how many assets an average asset manager at Reef manages? Any idea? Ashley, you like to take guesses. Seven. You got it, bingo, that's exactly right. One to 10, nice job. Uh, we're currently averaging a little higher than that. Our average right now is about 12 and a half. Uh, with the TC21 acquisition that you, the, you're probably aware of that we're working on, we're looking to buy 21 new multifamily complexes. That's going to be three new asset managers. Now look at the beauty of having a system and formulas. I don't have to sit here and just put out fires. I can plan ahead because we have a system. I can tell the leadership, hey, if you're going to buy 21 new multifamily communities, I need at least two asset managers to cover that, and I'm already slightly above our agreed upon ratio of one to 10, so I really need to hire three people. So we are, they're all starting on Monday. I don't know if you knew that. We got three people starting on Monday. And when those people start on Monday, what they're gonna do, I'll just go back here, and you can see that we have something called the uh, approved footprint. I don't know if we're logged, oh, it, it does come up. So you see, inside the manual, two clicks, you get an approved training program for asset managers. That includes hours of video, instructions, who they need to meet, where they, all of that is baked into the manual. It's pretty impressive, right? So yeah, we hire three asset managers. They all get uh, put on this approved uh, footprint. Their supervisor will make sure that they're going through the program. And if all goes well in 30 days, they'll be reef asset managers because they read the book and they know every single thing that we're talking about. Are they going to be amazing at it? No, that comes with time and experience. But again, institutional knowledge, certainty of outcome, uniformity, they're all gonna talk the same language, they're all gonna go through the same training. It's a lot easier to manage that way than just grabbing three people at different times and just training them on the go. That's really how you build to scale. It's impossible to build a big company. Uh, you know, if we had had this conversation three years ago, there were about 40 people that worked for Reef. We're over 300 now. You can't get to this scale, you can't manage effectively this scale without this kind of tool. All right, we're almost done with the manual. Uh, I could talk about this for hours, but you can see how detailed this gets and how we constantly have uh, references and external links in this thing. Like I said, there's over 250 pages. It covers every single department with a lot of charts and checklists and references and guidelines and how to build your, your Z drive folder, how to file everything internally, a lot of good stuff. If you have not already read this, it's a great resource and you have access to that for the interns here. You have access to this even while you're here. Strongly recommend that you spend some time digging through this manual. Uh, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you found an error, anything from a spelling error to some major logical error, Allie is your person. She maintains this manual. She's the one who can change it and I go over it every week and we publish a new version. 
Let me pause here before I go to Power BI. Questions about the manual, about the system, anything that you guys want to know? I'm curious how long it took to make all of this. Ali, how long did it take to make all this? Yeah, and that's, that's misleading because a lot, fair. First of all, Ali says that it's still going on and she's right, it's an ongoing process. To get from zero to what you're seeing would probably take about six months. When Ali started working with me on this manual, we already had two big components, the asset management manual, which, which I wrote, and the acquisitions and underwriting, which was written by somebody else. Um, I, I was the head of asset management here a couple of years ago. So those two kind of came together as the basis and Ali added everything in. Accounting, admin, media, IT, everything. Um, so a lot of work that went into this. Yeah, super. Um, oh, this is a great example. Well, I could talk about this for hours. So uh, I'll just give you this and then we'll go to Power BI. A and PM distinctions. So one of the things that I encountered when I first started running asset management here a couple of years ago, I'm no longer in that position, now it's Bruce's department, is that I kept hearing from asset management and property management that there's a lot of back and forth, you do this, no, you do this, you don't tell me, this is not my responsibility, who said that you do this, uh, okay. And you know what? You look at industry reference and you would find that there's companies that do it a certain way, companies that do it completely the other way. There is no really going back to uh, academia and seeing what the best way is. It's just different approaches. So what we settled in, and this took a while, we took the leaders from the asset management department, the leadership of property management department, we sat, it was right here in this room a couple of years ago, and we literally hashed it out. We said, all right, listen, we gotta come to an agreement. You tell me what you think, I'll tell you what I think, we'll find compromises, a little bit like a political process. Uh, we, we'll come together, both sides of the aisle, right? You've heard all those analogies, but we finally agreed on something. Say, hey, can you live with that? I'll give you this, you give me that, we'll do this for you. We finally agreed on it. We put it in writing, broke it down to what every party, said, every party is supposed to do, haven't heard a word about it since. Why? Because now, and this is where the term comes from, it's in the book. So if a new property manager, senior asset manager, vice versa, if they have a disagreement, they can literally pull up the book and say, hey, this is what we agreed on. This is what you're supposed to do, this is what I'm supposed to do. You don't like it, take it to your supervisor but you can no longer say, I'm not doing that. There are definitions. Wasn't always like that. All right, awesome. Did we answer your question? Yeah. Awesome. All right, so without further ado, let's jump to, uh, let me see how I'm doing on time. Oh yeah, bingo. So let's talk about our Power BI system. This is, this is where it gets really fun and interesting. You've probably, well, you've never seen anything, you've never seen this, because we are the only ones who have it, you may have seen something like it, but you probably have not. This really is, like uh, David Craigle said, cutting edge. We're still developing this as we speak. We haven't even officially launched our Power BI system. It was scheduled to launch uh, earlier this month and we pushed that back because of the big acquisition we have going on. We're probably maybe four weeks away from an official launch. It is a Microsoft product, Power BI, and, and we use that platform, but we design all of these dashboards. So everything that you're seeing is done in-house by our analytics team. We have one guy on the analytics team who's full-time dedicated to doing this only, you probably met him, and the rest of the analytics team is also super important. If you don't know who the analytics team are or what they do, open the manual when we're done and read all about it. Um, you can see that it's branded Reef, right? So it has our logos, it has our colors, it has our data. And I want to tell you something. We've looked at a lot, I've looked at a lot of off-the-shelf software before we started to do this. All the big players were here. Lobby CRE, IMS, RealPage, uh, there's a company called MRI Development. They were all here. They pitched us all. And they have really impressive products. None of them had the flexibility to do what we want. They wanted us to manage the operation according to their template. And we don't do that at Reef. We have multifamily assets, but we also have hospitality assets. We also buy ground and we do ground up development. We, we own land. I don't want to be looking at a multifamily and then shut down that system and open another system to go look at a hotel. I do both. If you can't figure that out, you're not the solution for me. We wanted the flexibility. Another thing that we do is 
We like to drill down and find KPIs, key performance indicators, that are driving the NOI for the property. You know, an NOI is an outcome. It's actually driven by occupancy and average rent and collection and the level of expenses. So I, just, I don't want to just see the NOI. That's too late. I want to see the underlying metrics that are driving that NOI so I can fix them if there's a problem earlier. And all of those guys were looking back at me like, you want what? We don't get it. All right, forget it. We're just going to do our own. So we did. We did our own. So how does this thing work? What, what are you really looking at? So this is, this is the main screen. So this is the asset, uh, well, this is the asset management dashboard. It's not even the main screen. But we'll, we'll talk about this for a minute, then we'll go back. So what you're looking at, obviously, is a visual representation of the data. And that's really what Power BI does. It's a visualization software. It's a visual representation of the data. You cannot mess up anything in Power BI because you can only read, you cannot write. So you're only looking at stuff. You can't, by accident, change anything. <laughs> we don't trust you. So what you're looking at is a, uh, obviously a geographical map, right? This is a map of the US, for those of you who haven't figured that out. And you're looking at all of our assets, and they're color-coded right here. 40 multifamily units, uh, I shouldn't say units, 40 multifamily complexes. We have uh, just over 10,000 units. We'll talk about units and keys in a minute. Nine hospitality assets, six land parcels, and four ground-up developments. And you can see where they are. Now, all you have to do is zoom in, find the one that you want, hover over it, and you get what we call the monopoly card. Um, it's basically the high level information about that property. So you know which property we're talking about. You can zoom all the way in and it will switch to satellite and you can actually see our multifamily complex. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. The other thing you can do once you find exactly the asset that you want, you can right click it and do what we call the drill through. So now you're getting a dashboard that is specific for the asset that you chose. It's pretty cool stuff. Like before this, you would have to go to the Z drive, open the right folder, and let's say you wanted to know what's the name of the property accountant. Uh, I don't know. You would have to look for that in an email. Now, boom, it's all there. And we have a team of people in the analytics department that maintain this. So if something changes, it updates. You don't need to do anything. So right off the bat, this is part of the Southeast One portfolio. You can see uh, that it's run by Reef Residential. You can see exactly where it's located. You can see who the asset manager is, and you can email them right away. You can see a visualization and data points about the capital stack. For, this is for every single asset. So you can see exactly how it's built. In this case, you can see the, uh, the ratio between equity and debt. You can see that there is no supplemental because that would be in yellow. So you guys probably know 74 70, 75% is our, usually our LTV. You guys are familiar with that, the loan to value? So this is where it's coming from. You can go asset by asset and see what is the ratio that we have between debt and equity. In some cases, we have supplemental or pref or other things. And you can get all the different data points about the loan and the capital stack. A lot of this stuff gets tabulated and calculated and pushed back out in another report. So for example, our Staghorn unit that sources debt they have what we call a refinance candidate report. It really aggregates all of this data for all, every single one of the over 50 properties that we have. And it tells them, hey, this, you're paying a high interest rate compared to what the computer found online. So you really should be looking at this. You could possibly do better. Or it will tell you if you're three months away from uh, maturity. This is 2030, of course, but there are examples where we're within a few months of maturity. And then the report will click and say, hey, this thing is about to mature. You might want to look at this and refinance or decide what you want to do. So that is how technology really works for you because that information exists. But before that, you would have to go into every single one of them, open it in a Z drive, find the loan documents, maybe put it on your calendar. Maybe you were responsible and did it. Maybe, maybe you didn't do it. Now everything is aggregated in the same place. We can also uh, look at and manipulate some key financial data. This is probably one of the most important screens for an asset manager. You can uh, take the a certain amount, this is T3, uh, trailing three months for income over T6, trailing months of expenses. So we're looking, we're annualizing. We're looking at the last three months of income, assuming that the expenses on an yearly basis would be like they were in the last six months. And that of course impacts this number your trailing economic NOI. Um, and we can play and manipulate that. We can look at 2019 numbers. We can look, uh, we don't project. 
This is just perform a comparison. So we don't, currently, Power BI, we don't, we don't do any projections. We'll, we'll introduce that in the next version. But what we're allowing you to do here is essentially look at what the performa, what the underwriting was for years in the future. So you can see, based on your current expenses the, and, and income, does it look like you're going to hit your target for 2023? Make sense? All right. Uh, and then the last thing that we have here is our management metrics. This is driven by our uh, MMR, the Monday morning report, to the extent that we're getting the data from um, Reef Residential. In some cases, we get it from DLP or from another property manager. We convert all of that, and you, you always get this information from your Power BI dashboard. You never have to go to the source. We, we do that for you. That's another benefit when we talk about operations and streamlining. It doesn't matter which property we buy. It doesn't matter who's the property manager. It doesn't matter what software they use because we convert all of that to a reef format. That's why when we train people, we train them the reef way because all they will ever deal with while they work here is the reef data. That's how you create professionals. That's how you can scale and train more and more and more people, consistency. So what you have here is 98% uh, occupancy, which is obviously uh, this number divided by that number, the percentage of delinquency in percentage and in dollars and how much was collected this month, and we can see how the occupancy is trending and we can see uh, AM fees or asset management fees, which is kind of important because that's how we make money. The one thing I want to explain about this, and we, we could do a deep dive into this, but I just want to show you a bunch more screens. The one thing that's important about this data point and really about every single data point in Power BI, the data doesn't lie, but data is often misunderstood. You have to understand how the data was calculated when was it calculated and what it really represents. And a lot of people will make that mistake. This is why we have manuals that explain to you how everything works. A lot of people will look at this and say, oh wow, 21% delinquency, that's high. Well, they're not necessarily taking into account when was this thing last updated. This is an MMR. It's based on a Monday morning report. Today is Friday. You, you have to keep that in mind. Also, if you're looking at this on the first, second, third of the month, of course delinquency is going to be high. You know, maybe the first and second were a weekend and tenants didn't have a chance to get their checks into the office yet. You have to understand there's a narrative behind the data. Generally speaking, and I'll show you something interesting in a second, generally speaking, you want the data to trend in a good direction. You can't have data trending down and tell me, oh, there's a narrative, it's actually all great. Eh, that doesn't work. But for a single data point, you have to understand who is counting it, when were they counting it, when did they report it, and how is it trending before you make a conclusion. So that's why I always say, this thing is great, but it doesn't replace the asset manager. It's, it's a tool. Um, we can switch to uh, an overview mode that basically aggregates the data. So this is a DSCR for the entire portfolio. Oh, I don't think I ever showed you this, but of course, you can slice and dice, right? So we can just kind of slice uh, only uh, individual assets. What I like to do a lot is go to Sunbelt 12. So you can see if I click a certain portfolio, all of the relevant data on the dashboard, it's an interactive dashboard. It all changes. So our DSCR, our debt service coverage ratio, as of uh, November 2020, is 2.43 on this portfolio. For those of you who know real estate, that's a good number. Uh, so, and again, it's not always like that. It depends which portfolio you go to, where I can click again and get an average for the entire, uh, for the entire 40 assets that are in the multifamily category. So these are, think about this, this is really more for management. Uh, most of your asset managers, property managers, uh, accountants, underwriters, they're not really dealing with portfolio level results. We do as management. When we go to raise capital, when people ask about our track records, when we have to talk to uh, retail or institutional investors, they, they want to know about the company as a whole. So that's what that uh, data provides. You can also slice and dice and also look uh, only at your assets in Arkansas. You guys probably know that we're very big in the Little Rock area. And of course, you can zoom in and see every single one of those properties. And then you can do the same for hospitality, ground up development, and all that good stuff. Um, in the limited time that we have, yeah, uh, I'll show you just a couple more screens and then we'll do questions and wrap it up. So th this actually is our home, uh, home screen, if you will. It aggregates multiple different dashboards from multiple different places. It is somewhat chronologically ordered. It's not perfect, but you're looking at acquisitions, uh, if something 
matures from an acquisition, it goes to underwriting, property management, asset management, and of course the deal team. The deal team is, is something unique to Reef. Uh, we're seeing other companies starting to adopt that model, but we have a senior vice president, a senior executive vice president that runs this team, and his job is to maintain everything that has a closing associated with it. An acquisition, a disposition, a refinance, or a, a construction draw has a closing, has closing documents, has uh, sometimes titles and, and all kinds of lender docs. We have a full-time dedicated team to make sure that we get to all these closings on time. You know why? Because without that, we could not be the company that we are. Because all of the other senior managers, the head of asset management, property management, legal, the amount of deals that we do, all of them would have to just take part in that deal. Give me this document, review this title. Uh, we all have to be there on Monday at nine o'clock. We can't do that. We have to be in a position where we have a deal, we agreed on the terms, we give it to the deal team and they execute it. The deal team is currently overseeing about 30 different closings. Think about it, TC21, we're buying 21 multifamily complexes. Every single one of those is a multi-million dollar closing. We're also selling some assets. We're also financing some land. Full-time work just to make sure those closing happen and that we don't drop the ball. And we don't. We're, and this is why you've probably heard Reef has an excellent reputation in the market for closings and for actually it's called a certainty of execution. When we tell somebody, hey, we're going to buy your property and we sign an LOI or we put it under contract, we always, in the history of Reef, we've never dropped the ball once. Anything that we put under contract, we closed on. Very few companies can tell you that. And that's because we're built for scale. If we were buying something, we mean it. We have the power to, the, we could be wrong, we may end up making a bad deal, but we have the ability to close on it. We're not just stretching and hoping that it works out. Hoping is not a strategy. So this is a, uh, the acquisition matrix. You're essentially looking at TC21, 21 assets under contract. This is how they scale up on a perception chart based on price per unit and cap rate. Um, these, these solid bars are the target bars. They're essentially, I'll show you, I'll show you how this looks like, uh, and we'll zoom in on this for a second. So the acquisitions, it's one of our most important screens. So what you're looking at is TC21. You can see all the assets that we're going to buy. They're all in the same color because now they're all under contract. When we were building this, they were not. We, we had some that were under contract, some under LOI, some under review, some under due diligence. I know some of you actually toured those units, uh, but now they're all under contract, so it looks very uniform. We're, it's over uh, half a million dollars worth that we're looking to buy, over 4,000 units, and this is really how they kind of spread on that perception chart that I described to you. So we would want, ideally, we would want everything right here. This is the target for acquisitions. That's the price per unit and cap rate that we're willing to pay. And you can see that the portfolio that we're buying is scattered around the target area. That means acquisition is doing a good job. If they had something here or something there, we would say, what? What is that? And we could be, we still have to listen to the narrative, but you can see that we're close. So when we can zoom in and uh, just on one of these portfolios and kind of see where they are and where they are on the chart. And of course, this is all live. So all I have to do is hover over that one dot and I would still get that monopoly card. So I figure out which asset you're talking about. It's pretty cool, right? Um, all right, we don't have a lot more time, so I'll fast forward. I'll show you one last thing and we'll take uh, some questions. So I want you to see the property management dashboard. The property management dashboard, one of the most important things that we have and here's why. We talked about a little bit about this before. Obviously, at the end of the day, we're all concerned with performance. Performance for us is money. IRR, return on your investment, dollars uh, that the company gets, that our investors get. We want to keep everybody happy. We want to do it the right way, but that's a metric that we care about. NOI, or the net operating income, is an outcome. Something is driving that NOI. So a lot of other companies will look at NOI, and when it goes bad, they'll call somebody in the room and say, hey, why is this NOI negative? Uh, what are you doing about it? We've analyzed that, and we're now going a step further. We're looking at what actually creates that NOI, and we're monitoring that, and we're color coding it, and we're graphing it. So this is your uh, DSCR, your economic NOI, your occupancy, your delinquency, and your average rent for every single one of our multifamily properties. 
Where we're, this is all based on the MMR, so this thing is updated weekly. And uh, we're already working on a plan to have this thing update daily through something called an API into the real page program. Haven't implemented that yet, that's coming in the future. You gotta remember, all of these things cost money and take time. I don't just flip my fingers and create this. I have a team of people working with me and we have engineers and we're paying licenses. It's not that simple. So there's always a cost benefit kind of formula that you have to maintain. You can't just do whatever you want and, and pay for it. But this is worth it. So right now we're on a weekly interval for these metrics. Financials are on a monthly interval. This is weekly. Weekly is pretty good. So what you're looking at is the different components for every single one of our assets. You can see where it is, you can see how it's trending, and you can see totals. So for example, what I'll do, I do this a lot, is I'll just slice out the Sunbelt 12, which is the most recent portfolio that we purchased in December of last year. Sunbelt 12, 12 multifamily communities around the Sunbelt uh, region, stretching from Texas all the way to the East Coast. So what you're looking at, by the way, you should all be familiar with our coding system. Uh, property code, the first letter is uh, M for multifamily. It will be H for hotel, L for land, or G for GUD. The next two letters are the standard abbreviation for the state. Arkansas, Texas, uh, well, Mississippi, we have others. Uh, and then the last three digits are the chronological order in which we purchased it. That's the coding system. Now when you look at it, every single peak, every single change in this graph is a data point. So you can see, in some cases, we're going back one, two, th one, two three, four, five months. Why are we only going back five months? Because that's when we bought it, right? So from the time we closed on it to the time we actually started getting financials, we only have five months worth of full data points. Occupancy, you can see we go back much further. Uh, delinquency, the same. We're, we're going back in months. We're going back probably 12 months at this point because we have data from what happened in the property before we took over. Uh, same uh, for average rent, we, uh, we currently just go by average, it's, it's a bit of a calculation, like I said, there's many ways of calculating it because when you look at average rent, it could be very misleading. Do you have more one bedrooms, two bedrooms, studios? What are you really measuring? So we just take the GPR, the gross potential rent, divided by the amount of units. So we're actually measuring dollars instead of average rent. But it is compared to the original underwriting. So we can see, so the beauty of this is this. Think of me in my role as, uh, as the chief operating officer of the firm. I have a, a standard, got, uh, got the 10 minute warning. Thank you, Carlos. So what we do, what I do when I sit down with the leadership for property management, we don't just have a discussion up in the air, hey, tell me what's going on. We bring up this board and we say, all right, generally speaking, green is good. Let's talk about the reds. And sometimes there's a good narrative. Not every red is bad. Red just means we need your attention. And of course, yellow is between green and red. It's what we call the, the traffic light system, right? We use it across the board in all of our dashboards. So I'm gonna end with an anecdote about the delinquency, and then I'll stop and give you uh, a chance for questions. You're looking at the board. You know that you're at Reef, Power BI system, multifamily. You see red, you know red needs your attention. You look at it, you say delinquency. Delinquency, of course, is the amount of people, percentage-wise, that have not paid the rent yet. And you see 33%. A third of the tenants are not paying rent? That's not, that can't be good news. So I sit down with property management and I tell them, hey, I don't know what you guys are doing over there. We need a new property manager. We need a collection agent. What, what's going on? And what did they tell me? Well, Jeff, actually look at the history of this thing. It tends to peak out every month relatively high. But if you go all the way here, we're at the DSCR of 3.5, one of the highest. So what does that mean? 33% of the people are not paying rent, but you're killing it. We're, we're making tons of money on this property. The investors love it. What's happening is that you have in this specific property, and you'll never know this without drilling down, which is what my job is, we have in this specific property a case of a few dozen habitual late payment tenants. They do pay, but they pay late. Now, you have to ask yourselves, you're all gonna be managers here at Reef one day, you have to ask yourself, is that a problem that I need to fix? At the end of the day, we're making a lot of money. Do I wanna kick those people out? Okay, I'll get, statistically speaking, I'll get people that pay on time, but statistically speaking, I'm also gonna get people that are not paying at all and I have to evict them. So is this really a problem? Is this a high priority? You've got to put everything into context. 
So even though you're looking at red, you really have to understand why you're measuring. At the end of the day, we decided that this is not a problem at all. So we're monitoring this, but because the DSCR is high, and actual collections always end up being high, they just end up being delinquent, they're late. Now, I argue that that's actually also an opportunity. Can you think of why? Fees, late fees. So if you have habitual late payment tenants, but you can actually collect fees and, and they do end up paying, one of the reasons you have a very high DSCR. So I'm just going to end with that anecdote. It's not as, running this company is not as simple as color coding. Okay, red is not always bad. Red means we need your attention. We need a narrative. We need to understand. But this is a tool. This is a tool for asset management to have a discussion with property management. And now we're talking about the data. We're not just talking in slogans. So to put it all together, between the manual that uh, you've seen, and I encourage you to read, it's, it's pretty thick. Uh, of course, use the online version because this is old. Between the dashboard system that you're going to have in a few weeks when we launch this, you really get the whole story about the company. And the more you know, the more you drill into the book, and the more you drill into every data point, the more professional you will become. I, I, we have people here that are already know more and understand better than their supervisors because it's all here. All you have to do is play around with it. And remember, you can't screw it up because you can't write in the manual and you can't touch the data here. You can only read it. So you can click any button you want. You can never damage it. Don't try this. Uh, don't try me, right? Don't find a way to, to mess with it. But yeah, you should not be able to mess with the data at all. It's read only. The more time you spend in those systems, the more questions you have for us at operations, the better you'll understand the entire ecosystem of how we do things. That's the time I have. I think we have literally five minutes. Uh, so choose your questions wisely, but we have five minutes for questions. What do you got? Are we able to see this right now or not until it's launched? So that's, that's a great question. That's what I always love to hear. Uh, the answer is no, you are not. Um, you, certain people in the company have access to this right now. When we officially launch it, we'll blast out an email to everybody. It will be, of course, in the manual. Ali is currently working with Cole, our director of analytics, on writing the guidance on how to use this, and then we'll provide you with a link. This is a cloud-based system. It will be available anywhere in the world at any time. You do not have to be in the office, but you need your Reef username and password. Um, I should also mention that both the manual and the Power BI are business confidential. It's not, it's not uh, national security. And it's not like if somebody sees this, we're all ruined. That's not how it works. But you know what? It is a collection of our best practices, uh, lessons that we've learned. There's some sensitive information about how we organize, how we buy. It's not for general consumption. I would not want to find any of this um, you know, on the internet. I'm showing you some highlights, and this is OK. We have investors in these properties. We push out this data, and none of this is a secret. But it's business confidential in the sense that we don't want the whole world to look at everything that we do all the time. But that's a great question. What else? Questions? How long did this take to build? <laughs> that's your favorite go-to question. Um, do you, uh, maybe slightly after we started the manual, I would say. So I would say this is a result of about uh, three months of work. Um, very much like the manual, it's an ongoing process. To be fair, the manual is very labor intensive up front, like putting the bulk of it together, and then it's a lot of maintenance. With the Power BI system, every month is a full time work for one person at least. We're adding dashboards, we're adding functionality to existing dashboards, we're creating some dashboards that you guys will never see because they're for senior management. Um, things like how the company is functioning. We, I have an HR dashboard that you won't see but I can click a button and see all the people that work here and how it breaks down and where they are. That's not for, for general consumption. We will not show that to everybody. Uh, so it's a lot of work, uh, a lot more than the manual. It is, it's also a lot more um, engineering oriented. So it's you know, different skills to work on this versus this. Believe me, if I put the engineer to work on the manual, you won't understand a word he, he says. Um, and vice versa, you know, we need these skills as well. The other thing to understand is you cannot just hire an engineer and let them build this because they don't even know. They don't know what you want to measure. They don't know what it means. So it's a lot of work in the analytics team between people that understand hardcore real estate and how we structure our deals 
and engineers that are able to literally hard code this into Power BI. And we actually used uh, some, some uh, coding language, uh, Python specifically, to add functionality that Power BI didn't even have because we wanted it. Uh, this is, it's not this version, but we'll have the next version mobile friendly. So all of these graphs will work on your phone. Pretty cool. Questions? When you, no? uh, when you use the dashboard, so for example, there are a number of terms across the top of each of the yep. categories. Can I wave the cursor across the top of the category and see the definition of what that formula is? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. Uh, it's a great question, and it comes up often, and it's super important. Um, a lot of the stuff that we model and we show you on the dashboard, and I slightly hinted at this when I said you have to understand what you're looking at. It may not be what you think you're looking at. So, and it's a great point. We're doing better at that. Uh, anything, of course, can be explained. So uh, the DSCR is, of course, common terminology, debt service uh, uh, coverage ratio. But SVG is standard vector graph. Uh, you probably wouldn't know that unless you read the manual. Uh, how these things are calculated and why are they color-coded the way they are is generally explained somewhere on the chart. In this case, we have a full example of how we calculate the economic NOI. When is the DSCR triggered between yellow, green, and red? Uh, delinquencies, what triggers the different colors? You're absolutely right, because if you look at it and you see something red, well, what does red mean? Uh, where's the threshold? What does yellow mean? Uh, okay, so that's a great question. And the answer is, and I can go into multiple different other dashboards, we try to always have a living legend on that same dashboard so you can understand the data that you're looking at. We're not perfect. There are some things that we could probably explain even better. It's a combination of looking at the dashboards and reading the manual. Um, and you know, if we do a little bit of beta testing, probably not enough. Beta testing is the concept of taking the dashboard, giving it to somebody like you who's never seen it before and say, what do you understand from this? and see if your basic intuitive logic is what we meant. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So that's a great question, definitely something we should do better. Questions? All right, so we'll wrap it up. I invite you to look at our company manual and our Power BI dashboard when they are available. And guess what, how will you know that it's available? Because we'll advertise and publish a link in the manual. You should all have a link to the manual. If you don't, you can ask me or Ali. And again, once you look at it, if you have any questions about reef or reef operations, my door's always open, come ask. Thank you for your time. <laughs>